which is pretty awesome. So, so pray for them while they're there. I'm, I'm praying that they just have a good experience and they meet Jesus in a powerful way. In just a second, we're going to jump into the book of Nehemiah. But before we do that, Pastor Silas asks you the question as to what is the greatest movie sequel of all time? In fact, I actually Googled it because I was curious. And this is the answers that most people seem to say are the best movies of all time in terms of sequels. This is the, this is the one that repeatedly won pretty much contest after contest, like, like uh, Empire Strikes Back, uh, Aliens, because Alien is awesome, but Aliens is super cool. Uh, Terminator 2, I'll be back, that one's amazing. Uh, the Dark Knight is the best of that whole series. That was a phenomenal movie. And then Top Gun Maverick is perfect. In fact, of, of, if I was to say of any recent movie that you don't have anything to criticize, that movie is like perfect. It's, it's crazy good. Those are just like the best sequels that a lot of people say of all time in terms of the movies. I'm only bringing it up because the book of Nehemiah is the sequel of the book of Ezra. Last week we talked about the book of Ezra. The sequel, I must say sequel, sequel. is Nehemiah. Is Nehemiah. In fact, uh, like th this is kind of the way this thing rolls. It's not really in your note sheets yet, but I, I, I got to throw it up here. Ezra rebuilds the temple in Jerusalem. So the book of Ezra is like, build the temple. Everybody said, build the temple. <laughs> and then the book of Nehemiah is, let's build the walls. So one book, they're building the temple. Next book, <laughs> building the walls. They got some walls they got to build around the city of Jerusalem to keep the bad guys out. They got to make sure, come on, say, so build the walls. They got to build the walls. And then this is my favorite thing about Ezra and Nehemiah. So Ezra, we talked about it last week. Ezra, it says that he got so frustrated with the people's sins that he pulled out his own hair and beard. He's like, no! And he pulls out his hair and beard. Like what's great about Nehemiah is Nehemiah learns from Ezra. He's like, I'm not pulling out my hair and, hair and beard. I'm pulling out theirs. <laughs> In fact, Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 25 says he gets so ticked, the people go back to the same stupid behavior that he goes over and pulls out their hair and beard. And he made all the, all the fathers promise stop doing this or i'm going to keep pulling out your hair and <laughs> learn the <laughs> it hurts them way more than it hurts me <laughs> you know that old discipline you know it's hurting me way more than it's hurting you it ain't true <laughs> so he just went to town on them which i think is hilarious so this is kind of the book of nehemiah one's building one's building the temple and the other ones come on say building the walls Building the walls. I'll give you a little background information on, on Ezra or Nehemiah before we go to prayer. It's the six, book 16 of 66. The author of Jewish tradition identifies Nehemiah as the primary author. Most of the book is written from his first person perspective, type of literature's history. Book of Nehemiah is the sequel of the book of Ezra and tells the story of Nehemiah leading his people to rebuild the walls. The date's about 445 to 420. So you're still talking 2,500 years ago. Time period covered is about. Not very long, just a few years in that sequence. The big idea of Nehemiah is leadership strategies to advance God's kingdom. Leadership strategies to advance God's kingdom. In fact, the way I like to think about the book of Nehemiah is it is a master class on how to do something great for God. If you read through the book of Nehemiah, it is just this guy gets a mission and a vision from God, and then he just goes all out to make it happen. Uh, his, his calling is to build the walls, but he, he leads an entire group of people to accomplish something that had not been done in a long, long time. It's a, it, it, like I said, if you ever want to do something great for the kingdom of God, the book of Nehemiah is the book you need to really pay attention to because it will teach you to be a leader. Who would like to be a leader? Can I see your hands? Woo! Yeah, this book is like the book about leadership in the kingdom of God. So I'm gonna pray and then we'll have a conversation about this book. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for every life in this room. We thank you that we get to seek you and serve you. We thank you that just week by week we are working our way through the books of the Bible and we are learning different elements of your character. We're learning different, ele different elements of who you are, Jesus. We're also learning how to live lives that honor you, filled but with the Holy Spirit, dedicated to the kingdom of heaven and not the kingdom of this earth. Everybody say, my heart's open. My mind's ready. Make me better, God. Transform me with your word. Lead me now, Jesus. All God's people said, amen. amen. So like I said, this is like a master class on how to become a leader in God's kingdom and then how to lead. In fact, you're going to find four steps here in this text about how leadership works 
And most of the hands in the room are like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to be a better leader. I'd love to like maybe be a positive influence on my world. This is going to teach you how. We're just going to go through these, th this book and show you this stuff. So here's Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. It says this. It came to pass in the month of Shislev, in the 12th month uh, of the year of Susha, uh, the, in the citadel that Hanani, one of my brothers, all those words are like, <laughs> yeah, I'm not speaking in tongues. I'm trying to read. <laughs> one of the brethren came uh, with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. How's Jerusalem doing? And they said, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. In other words, they're poor, the city's broken, and then he goes further and says, the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and I wept and I mourned for many days. First step towards you wanting to become a leader in God's kingdom, number one, is you have to embrace your holy discontent. Come on, say embrace your holy discontent. Anybody remember watching Popeye as a kid? Can I see your hands if you watched Popeye? Okay, so like the, 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 the main line for Popeye that just comes up again and again and again in this old 19 whatever year cartoon is this is all I can stand and I can't stand no more. And then he eats the spinach and he, he punches out the bad guy, right? That's kind of how it goes every time. There's just something that gets under his skin and he just can't handle it any longer. That is what people define as a holy discontent. It's something that matters to you and you can't do nothing. You have to do something. So to Nehemiah, it was the walls of Jerusalem were broken down. These walls of the city, this is God's city. It's God's town. It's the place that God loves most. It's the, it's the one town in the world that, that uh, is the most, it's, ca it's called the holy city of God. In fact, if you're not praying for Jerusalem, please be praying tonight for them because Iran launched drone attacks on Jerusalem today. They have not landed in Jerusalem yet, but they are flying over Iraq in the direction of Jerusalem right now. Even as we're having this conversation, Israel is under attack again, this time by Iran. Now, these walls, all broken down and busted up, just really got underneath Nehemiah's skin. Now, most people, when you hear bad news, you go, oh, that sucks. And you kind of move on, like, I got a business to run, I got kids to raise, I got, I got bills to pay, I got to go. Not really my fight. But there's going to be a fight that God will not let you let go of. There's going to be something that it just irritates you to the place where you have got to do something. It could be uh, the direction the school system is going and you're watching it become less and less a safe place for believers and it's becoming more and more corrupt. It could be you're seeing uh, neighborhoods falling apart. It could be that in different parts of the world, you feel like they, see, they need to know the gospel and so you want to become a missionary. You're, like, there's, like there's different, everybody say holy discontent. holy discontent. Every person that is a follower of Jesus, God has something he wants you to accomplish with your life that if, that advances God's kingdom and pushes back the kingdom of darkness. What is, what is your holy discontent? So it's real easy for me to define mine. Uh, my, I've had two in my life. The first one was I felt like there was not relevant churches where people were preaching the gospel that I could take a family member or friend to that I felt like was a place where they could receive Christ and be transformed. And so we planted churches and we just got on this church planting kick and we just planted church after church after church after church after church after church. And it was my whole, like, whatever happens, like, I want, when, I, when I go to my grave, I want, to, I want people to say, he planted churches. Why? It's my holy discontent. Amen. I want to see every neighborhood and town on planet earth have a church that preaches the Bible that is a light in a dark world. That is my number one holy discontent. Number two would be secondary discontent, would be biblical illiteracy. I am astounded by the fact that people call themselves Christians and they, can't, they don't even know the books of the Bible. It like, it like literally, like if you, wanna, if you wanna get me mad, tell me how much you love Jesus but don't know anything about his word. I'd be like, what the heck? Jesus and his word are connected. If you don't know his word, you don't know Jesus. Amen. 
You're Jesus E, but you don't know him. And so I just have this, this massive holy discontent for people not knowing the scriptures. And so that's why we started the Bible college 10 years ago. And we just started training people in the word. Know the word, know the word, know the word. That's why the word for the year for all 48 of our churches was biblical illiteracy because it, dry, it gets, gets under my skin. Come on, if you would just read your Bible, if you would just study the word, your life could be okay. No matter how crappy the circumstances are, if you're in this book every day, you're not whining and a weasel. Amen. Amen. You're living a stronger, better life because you know, come on, say know the word. Know the word. See my holy discontent? You see it coming out of me? It's automatic. It's automatic. You want to you wanna, you wanna get me riled up? It's about believers not knowing the word. Amen. Maybe you should go to the Bible college. That was, that was not an advertisement. That was your future at stake. Amen. That's honestly what I think is true. So holy discontent, Nehemiah has one. He's like, I can't live with these walls broken down. This is God's holy city. I can't stand it no more. And he says, what am I going to do about it? So then we'll keep reading. So remember, he's just trying to lead in God's kingdom. Nehemiah 1 verse 4, this is the, next, just the very next phrase. Notice it doesn't say, so I went and built the walls. The next phrase is, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. A lot of times people get holy discontents and then they run off and try to do something and they never even asked God. They never asked God if this was a worthy investment of their life or of their time or of their energy they just got something underneath their skin and they got a, and they never even bothered to ask if it was God's thing or their thing. Come on, say pray and fast. Pray and fast. You want to be a leader in God's kingdom, you pray and fast until God gives you an action plan. You pray and fast until God gives you an action plan. So Nehemiah hears the problem and doesn't go to work. He goes to prayer. When was the last time you prayed and fasted until God told you what your next step was? Like, you know, like, actually hit your knees with a prayer request that you were just dedicated to seeing God do something with. So, remember, my holy discontent was originally planting churches. I felt like we just needed to see more churches happen. And so, I went to my pastor at the time. I was a youth pastor, and I said, I'd like to plant a church. And he said, you're not ready go be a youth pastor. That's what you are. And so I walked back down the hallway and I began to pray. Do you know my wife and I prayed every day for four and a half years? We did nothing for four and a half years except pray. And our prayer was, God, when it's time for me to plant a church, I need my pastor, my spiritual authority to come to me and tell me to plant a church. Until then, I won't do it. Oh, but I was trained. I had a master's degree in theology. Why didn't you just go do it? Because my pastor said I wasn't ready. And we live under authority. And so I be just fasted and prayed. And four years go by, and one day I'm sitting in my office, and I'm writing a message for, for senior high kids. And my, my pastor came walking in my office, and he looked at me and said, Eric, we need to start a new church in Elk River. I think you should go and do it. And I was like, wait, what? And he's like, I got to go. And he just walked back out of his office. I'm, I was like, well, I got, I, so I called Kelly on the phone. I'm like, hey, guess what? Pastor Dave says we got, we got to start a church. We're starting one in Elk River. And she goes, where? <laughs> I said, Elk River. And we didn't even choose the city. It was prayed about. It was fasted over. We waited. And then when God spoke, we acted. But not until then. Many times the reason why you fail to build the walls of the thing you're trying to build is because you run out and try to do it on your own rather than ask God if it's the right project. Amen. Or maybe it's even the right project, but you haven't learned not to be a jerk yet. You haven't learned enough of the word of God yet. You haven't got discipled enough in your faith. You just don't, you're just not quite ready yet and remember Americans love microwaves because it's quick but it's crappy 
On the other hand, you put something in a crock pot and let it slow cook for like eight hours and you can smell it and the onions and the juices and like, you're like, oh, you're like, I can't wait, I can't wait. And you just keep waiting a little longer, a little longer. Oh, it's so good, right? Because you waited rather than rushed it. Come on, say fast and pray. Third, we'll keep reading. So this is, this is, now we're in chapter two of Nehemiah. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, was, there was no cars then, I promise. Uh, in the 12th year of King Artix, some of you are like, I have a biblical car. <laughs> King Artix Xerxes, when the wine was before him, then I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I'm gonna stop you for a second. Nehemiah's job was he was the cupbearer to the king. He had to sip the wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned and then he would bring it to the king. Once he knew it wasn't poisoned, then he could take it to the king. His only job was, was die on behalf of the king if somebody's poisoned in the wine. And so he's doing his job, like always. Uh, and it said, I took the wine and I gave it to the king. Now I had never been before been sad in his presence before. Well, why not? Well, if you study, if you study Babylonian and Persian law, if the cupbearer is sad in the presence of the king, it means there must be something wrong with the wine. <laughs> and the, king, the king's like, ah, I don't want that. Whatever you got going on, I don't want to sip whatever you're drinking. <laughs> so whenever the cupbearer came in with the wine, he always smiling. In fact, even further, if you, study, if you study history, you find out that if the cupbearer wasn't smiling and the wine wasn't bad, they would kill the, the cupbearer. It was a rule that you had to smile, and if you weren't smiling, you better be dying from poison. Otherwise, the king gonna kill you. So as the cupbearer, he comes walking in with the wine and it says, and I have never before been sad in his presence. And he just, he just goes for it. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. I'm, he's thinking, I'm about to die. And I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? And so I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, I love the way, like he's like, in his head he's like, okay, I came in sad, I, I took a risk. He asked me why I'm sad and he's not killing me. God, give me the strength to say the right words. And then he just went for it. And he just like, he just goes for what he wants. He says, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it please the king and if your servant have found favor in, in, in your sight, I ask that you would send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I might rebuild basically Jerusalem. Number three, number three. You wanna be a, a leader in God's kingdom? You take a risk. Come on, say take a risk. Amen. Boldly step in faith in the direction God wants you to go. That means in, Nehemi in, in Nehemiah's case, he had to get... He had to be, have backbone enough to go into the presence of the king knowing he could die with a frown on his face. And he went for it. And he gets what he wanted. Guys, most people never do anything great for God's kingdom because they just won't take a risk. They're just too fearful, too afraid, it's too much, it's too hard, it's too, mu it's too much of a problem. I don't know if it'll succeed, I don't know if it'll fail. And I'm telling you, leaders play in traffic. Amen. Let's go. Look at the person next to you and say, play in traffic. Play in traffic. It is my favorite phrase to talk about what it means to walk by faith. Most people stand on the edge of the road and they watch all the cars and it's just so many cars and I can't possibly, and well, I'm gonna get hurt and I can't and I just, I'll just go back to work. And guys, you're only gonna get about 75 years to stand here at the edge of the road. Amen. And your life is over. At some point, you gotta take a faith step. You gotta step out in the road and try. Ah, but I don't wanna play Frogger. That's part of faith. Amen. Remember Frogger? E -e 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 <laughs> Better to be <laughs> and stand at the edge of the road and whine. A lot of people, they won't take risk. And then they never see anything great for the kingdom of heaven. What would that look like in our world today? Maybe set up the meeting that you know you're supposed to have. 
Stop saying, I'm going to talk to this person, I'm going to talk to this person, I'm going to talk to this person, I'm going to talk to this person. Just set the meeting up. Fill out the application at the place you really want to work. Send the resume off to the place. Stop being like, wouldn't it be cool if I could work there? Go back to college so you can work there. Oh, but college is expensive. Go anyway. Stop saying you can't do, I'm too old, I'm too young, I don't know, I can't figure it out. Take a risk, write a check. There's this thing you know you're supposed to do for the kingdom of heaven, write the check. There's a guy I know that comes to this church. He has a $40,000 check on a board, bulletin board in his house. And he prays over it. And it's already written out to the church. And he's praying for the day he gets to give a $40,000 check. He's like, I'm just, it's already written on the wall. It's, it's there. I'm, I'm going to do it. It's going to happen. Pastor, that's going to happen. There's going to be a day that check gets, gets, gets put in the offering bucket. Because he's, he's already in it. He's just, he's just moving in the direction of something rather than, I, I, wouldn't it be cool if I did a thing? Remember when you were 12 and you were playing basketball in your driveway? And you're like, I'm hearing all the crowd. Ah, crowd goes wild. And you shoot. And he scores. He wins the basket. Yeah. And you're just, it's called daydreaming. And it led to nothing. People who walk by faith and see God do great things, they stop daydreaming. And when God has, when they're done praying and fasting, they step. They take a risk. So I went to 20 people in my church and I said, hey, we're going to start a church. I'd like you to come join me. 16 said yes. Out of, out of 1,500 people that went to that church, 16 said yes. Amen. Somebody wrote me a $20,000 check. I took the $20,000 and we spent it all on advertising. But you weren't going to get paid if you spend it all on advertising and a sound system. I'm like, yeah, but if I don't spend it on advertising and a sound system, there won't be anybody here. Amen. And we took a step. And when the first, the first week, when 200 and some people showed up, oh, look at that. It worked. If nobody had showed up, better to have tried and failed than not tried at all. Amen. Glory. Glory. And this is the thing. That's going to cause you to move forward in faith. What's the thing you need to do? Some of you are like, I know I want to go to the Bible college. I know I want to go to the Bible college. Well, then fill out the application. But I, but I can't afford it. I can't, I can't afford it. Oh, dude, do you know the number of people that go every year that fill out the application and they say they can't afford it and God just pays their bills? Woo. Yeah. Do you know that when I went off to college, at the end of the year, I still owed $3,500 so they would not give me my diploma from the Bible college? The first Bible college I went to. So I could not get my diploma. I'd done all the work, but I owed 3500 I went back home from New York to Iowa. I got a job. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going to pay it off. So they sent me the diploma. I got a job. I was working three jobs to try to pay the thing off. And one day out of the blue, literally within three months, uh, a guy from the Bible college called and said, uh, somebody miraculously, anonymously just paid off your bill. You, I'll just send you the, the diploma in the mail. God does stuff like that. But you got to step in faith. You got to decide to move instead of just wishing, wishing for a better, a, a better knowledge of the word, wishing for a better family, wishing for a better future, wishing for a better job. Hope and wish is not strategies. Amen. It will keep you stuck at the edge of the road. But there's something good on the other side if you will play in traffic. Amen. Come on, say, take a risk. Take a Look at the person next to you and say, stop wimping out. We said with all grace. <laughs> we'll keep reading. So now we're to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 17. He leads all these people. He gets permission from the king to go and rebuild the walls. And so they begin to build, and the walls start to grow up, kind of like these walls I have over here. But then bad guys come against them. In fact, there's a bunch of people who do not want these walls built. There's a bunch of people who are enemies of God's work and they will always try to stop you. Oh, you say you, you want to give to your church? There's always somebody who's going to tell you, that's foolish to give to a church. 
Because they don't have the things of God in mind, but the things of men. Oh, I really feel like I'm called to mission work. Oh, you know what? That's too much of a risk. You're going to be poor and broke, and it's going to be horrible, and blah, blah, blah. There'll, there'll be as many naysayers as people encouraging you. In fact, let's change that around. There'll be way more naysayers than there are people who encourage you. Yes or no? Yeah. Yeah. So he starts building this wall, and it gets part way up, and people start threatening him. If they can't talk him out of it, then they start to threaten him. And they say, we're coming for you, and we're coming for your family. We're going to shut this thing down. There's all kinds of rumors going around. It, it, it's, it's a mess. And then you get to Nehemiah 4, verse 17. The laborers carried on their work with one hand supporting the load and the other holding a weapon. So rather than give up because of naysayers, and by the way, guys, Jesus did not give up because of naysayers. But I see believers do it all the time. Oh, they said this, and they said that, and somebody mocked me for this, and oh, woe's me, and I can't possibly, I guess I'll just go slick my head in shame and go hide in a corner. And the devil applauds every time you give up. Every time you go hang your head and say, I can't possibly, and it'll never work. But what we learned from Nehemiah is Nehemiah tells the people, I want you to put a trial in one hand and a sword in the other and I want you to get back on the wall so what he tells the people is you know what we are called to get this thing done and so we're going to do it no matter what no matter what comes next no matter how it goes we're going to defend the wall and we're going to build the wall come on say it defend the wall build the wall Say it again. Say, defend the wall, build the wall. What would it look like to defend the wall and build the wall? Oh, on the one hand, we build the kingdom of heaven through prayer. It is the trowel. We just hit our knees and we seek the Holy Spirit for power and strength and action. Oh, what's the sword? The scripture says the sword is the word of God. And the more you learn the word and connect to God in prayer, you can build stuff that other people can't build. And you can defend stuff other people give up on. Come on, say build the wall. Defend the wall. This is what is the calling of every Christian is. It is not just, oh, you know, my family is in a tough spot, so I couldn't possibly volunteer at the same time. No, you're building your family and you're serving your church. Oh, I don't possibly have time to, it's just, it's just, no, we're building this and we're still serving the kingdom. It is, come on, say it's both. both. And the enemy's going to come at you and think that there's some sort of dumb dichotomy. If, if I don't have time to build, then I possibly can't defend. And it is both. It is an entire lifetime of building God's kingdom and defending God's kingdom. And we just never, come on, say never quit. Never quit. Once again, look at the person next to you and say, stop wimping out. You just don't quit. No matter what happens, you keep moving forward, advancing God's kingdom. You just don't give up and you don't give in. That means, okay, so you apply to the Bible college, you get accepted for the Bible college, and then when you don't have any money, you keep going and you keep giving the little bit you got until you pay the bill. Amen. And you decide you're going to serve in kids' church, and it's a whole heck of a lot of work. And those kids are little awesome, crazy people. And you stay the course, you stay the course, and it stretches your faith. Did you hear those volunteers talk about how they had been grown by serving those kids? It is a dumb dichotomy to be like, oh, you know what? I'll tithe when my business succeeds. That's foolishness. You build God's kingdom and you fight for your business. Come on, say it's both. both. Oh, I'll finally talk to my friend about faith when, no, you just go for it. You just speak up. You just talk about Jesus and you, you just move forward. And So this Easter was the largest, I, I don't want you to applaud because it doesn't really matter that much. 
It really doesn't matter that much. This was the largest Easter in the history of the church. Among 48 locations, we had a combined total of over 7,000 people, which is awesome. I mean, it really is super awesome. But that 7,100 whatever people took 20 years. 20 years. October is the 20th anniversary of the church. It was not like overnight, look what happened. It was a lot of work. In fact, the way that uh, my pastor taught me of how ministry works or how walking with Jesus is walking with Jesus is always brutal. Everybody say brutal. It's brutal and it's beautiful. There's a beautiful part of walking with Jesus, and we're celebrating as people walk across the line of faith and follow Jesus. We're celebrating people getting baptized. We're celebrating us because we grew spiritually and uh, our marriage got fixed or we kicked, kicked drugs or alcohol or we got transformed. There's so much to celebrate, but at the same time, you better keep the sword in your hand because at the same time, walking with Jesus is brutal. Ask Jesus. It was brutal. We are willing to pay the price for the cause of Christ. We are willing to pay the price for the cause of Christ. That means time. That means treasure. That means reputation. By the way, everybody wants to preach to thousands. They just don't want to sacrifice to do it. People love the idea of doing something great for the kingdom, but I don't want the blood, sweat, and tears of actually doing the hard work to build the kingdom. And it takes years and time and effort and grief and pain and loss and tears and more pain and more grief. And you, it's this, just the world we live in is we are behind enemy lines until Jesus returns. And so we just keep paying, come on, say pay the price. For the cause of Christ. What is the thing you keep wimping out on? And you could do something great, but you just don't want to pay the price. My mom told me this story earlier today. I was driving back from Iowa, and she's on the phone with me, and she says, back when your dad and I were first married, we were sitting in a service, and there was a missionary guy talking about missions. And he said, if you feel like you're called to missions, I want you to get up out of your seat and I want you to come to the front and say you're going to give your life to the mission field. And she said, your dad jumped up out of the chair. We said, well, we've been married a couple months. And he grabbed my hand and he went running for the front and I grabbed his hand back and pulled him back down. (laughs) And I said, what are you doing? And he said, I want to be a missionary. And she said, I don't. (laughs) And you know, that was their first married couple fight. And for the next, honestly, the next 15 years, he didn't get to do ministry. Because my dad, my mom just kept, no, no, we don't want to, it's too much, it's too much of a price. And she said then she was in a service kind of like this. And she said the guy up front said, What do you fear? Why would you not give that up for the cause of Christ? And she said, I started weeping. (laughs) And she said, that night I got on my knees and I told God whatever you wanted to do with our lives for the rest of it, I'm yours. And the remainder of my parents' marriage was full-time ministry and dad preaching and teaching and leading people and encouraging people and mom right alongside him. In fact, now that my dad's gone, the thing that my mom loves most is she just leads Bible studies for older ladies. And she's living the remainder of her life in faith because she surrendered it all to Jesus. What's your thing? What are you not willing to risk? Maybe it's time to give it up. I'm going to give you two little thoughts about how Jesus shows up in the book, and they're basically the same thing we just mentioned, and then we'll wrap it up. So Jesus and Nehemiah, like, like Jesus, like Nehemiah, 
had a holy discontent. He had a very clear holy discontent. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What was Jesus' holy discontent? He didn't want you to go to hell. Amen. Look at the person next to him and say, please don't go to hell. Don't, don't, don't laugh at that. That was Jesus' holy discontent. He went through hell so you'd never have to go to hell. That's a guy who took his holy discontent seriously and went through the brutal nature of rescuing from sin, Satan, and death. Secondarily, Jesus, like Nehemiah, was willing to do whatever it took to complete the mission. He was willing to do whatever it took, whatever it takes, whatever it takes. I will do whatever it takes. I will give everything I got to give. I will sacrifice everything I have to sacrifice. I'm just not going to quit till the mission is accomplished. What if that was your thought too? This is Luke chapter 9, verse 51. This is the, the this is the last season of Jesus' life. The scriptures, I, this is one of my favorite verses, Luke 9, 51. It just says Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He knew he was gonna die. He knew they were gonna kill him. And it was like he'd been walking this direction and been doing miracles and everything had been sweet and happy and beautiful and fun. And he just turned his back on beautiful and embraced brutal. And it says he's resolutely set his face towards the mission of God and gave his life for you and me. That leads us to the last part of this. And this is, there's somebody supposed to play guitar, send them out. Because we got to be done. Let's just apply it really quick. And I want you to write them down. This is, I actually want you to get a pen out and I want you to write this stuff down. What? is your God-given holy discontent. If you don't have anything yet, well then that's definitely a season for prayer and fasting. Because God has something he wants you to accomplish. There's some battle he wants you to fight that other people can't. There's some mission, not everybody is gonna be like Bible college or church planting, that's okay. There's a million things that need to be advanced in God's kingdom, yes or no? If you ask Pastor Carly what her holy discontent is, it's, it's little kids knowing Jesus and raised on a foundation of faith. And so she has built her life around trying to make sure kids know the gospel and are raised up in faith. That's just her holy discontent. What's yours? If you don't know what yours is, oh man. That leads me to the second question. Are you willing to pray and fast and ask God for a plan of action? Are you willing to pray and fast and ask God for a plan of action. If you know what your holy discontent is, you still need to pray and fast and ask God how to approach it. What do I do next? How do I do this? Not what do I want to do, but how do you want me to do this? What, what do I say? What do I not say? Who do I talk to? Who do I not talk to? There needs to be a season where you've really gone to prayer about God, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? Will you do that? We're reading Ezra this week, and even the verses we were reading today, it was either yesterday or today, we're talking about that group fasting and praying for God to give them direction. It's just part of our faith process. Third question, what risk or step of faith is God asking you to take? If it's fill out an application to a Bible college, fill it out. If it's write a check, write a check. If it's apply for a new job, apply for the job. If it's go back to school, go back to school. If it's start a business, start a business. If it's... But whatever you do, take the step. Once again, look at the person next to you and say, take the step. And then question four, are you willing to pay the price for the cause of Christ. This verse in Acts tells me what the disciples were like after witnessing Jesus risk it all. Acts 15, 26, these are the men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The enemies of the disciples said, these are the guys who risked their lives. What do you want said at you over your life? I want two things said of me. Two things, you planted churches. Someday, when I'm dead, I want somebody at my funeral to talk about not 
Yeah, I wanted to say, first of all, that he loved his family well. That's more than anything else. But then beyond that, my whole two holy discontents, he planted churches for the kingdom of Jesus. And two, he did everything he could to push back biblical illiteracy in the world. And if that's the legacy of my life, it's enough. It's enough. And we will pay the price to make that happen. This leads you to doing something significant for the kingdom. But here's the thing. You can't do something great for God's kingdom until first you submit yourself to God's kingdom. That's right. All of this conversation was about leading in the kingdom of God. Well, maybe first you ought to be a part of the kingdom. The initiation process to God's kingdom is baptism. Baptism is, the, is where you get like initiated into the family. You've never been baptized. Well, can't really do something great for God's kingdom until first you get baptized. Amen. Baptism is the first step and you walk in this journey with God. Pastor Silas over here tonight, we got short shirts, towels, chlorinated water. If you've never been baptized, I know you've got other stuff to do, but there's nothing greater than walking with Jesus. And then the other part of that is, don't forget, even before you get baptized, you have to submit your heart with prayer. You have to verbally confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead and then you will be saved. So just for a second, bow your head, close your eyes. We're gonna just pray out a simple prayer. And I'm just gonna invite you to pray it with me. Just say, Jesus Christ, thank you that you died for me. Thank you that you risked it all to save me from hell. Tonight I surrender my life to you. I make you my savior and my God. You're my leader and Lord. May I follow you till the day I die and then take me to eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys glad you came to church tonight? invite you to stand to your feet. Once again, if you'd like to get baptized, you come see Pastor Silas. We're just going to end with our final blessing. Say this out loud with me. God, be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth, his saving power among all nations. I love you. Have a good night. Woo.